Well, I'm very excited to be here uh, because of the topic, because of the place, and because of the audience. Finally, I get to talk to engineers. <laughs> this is an idea whose time has come, and I'd like to start by saying that I don't know which philosopher said this, probably some modern philosopher, but he said that, or she, uh, that human beings are the only animal species on the planet that spends half of their time worrying about things that will not happen. It sounds like a Brian Greene statement on one of his Nova shows. So what I'm going to tell you about is something that should have happened, could have happened, and it happened. <laughs> So we begin with uh, the, the view of the Earth according to the current director of the uh, <coughs> national, NOAA. And uh, indeed, you might recognize some of these other names too. Uh, and they say that as of 1997, as if we didn't know, human beings now dominate virtually every single uh, eco-zone on the planet. And that doesn't mean that we're doing it right. It just means that we're doing it. And it's got huge environmental consequences as a result. So what, how did we come to this? How did we avoid thinking about the future in a way that would have corrected all of that? So we had these early visions. Some of them were quite interesting. And some of them uh, captured our imagination, like this one by Buckminster Fuller, in which he wanted to protect the built environment from the outside world. So he put a bubble over it. That seems like a silly idea, doesn't it? But in the days that he was suggesting this, it didn't seem too impractical. And in fact, if you want to go to Mars, this might be the way to build a city up underneath a bubble. Well, it might have some applications in the future. But look what happened. Movies like this came out, uh, extolling the virtues of all of this and uh, making everything seem mechanical, making everything seem robotic, making everything seem impersonal. Today, uh, we <laughs> have just the opposite take. We take our endangered species and put them underneath to protect them from us. This is an actual project that exists in England called the Eden Project, in which they've taken all the endangered tropical plants that they can get their hands on, and they've put them indoors into these huge domes in which they're environmentally controlled. It's in Cornwall, England. It's not a tropical zone by any means. But it, what it does mean is that we can control the indoor environment to suit virtually any life form that we choose. What will tomorrow's cities look like? This would be a Jetsons family view of the city of tomorrow. And, you know, it's kind of attractive because it's got all these domes. It's a Buckminster Fuller-like city. But, you know, I'm not sure what it would be like to live in this. Where are the parks? Where are the uh, recreation areas? Uh, you know, where are you going to relax? Looks like it's always busy, right? Looks like some scene out of a Bruce Willis movie. So <clears throat> these are the big challenges. No matter which future you envision, this is what you're going to have to deal with. All of these challenges are with us now. They were with us in the past, and they will be with us in the future. So we have to address these. And I think all of these can be addressed through engineering. And I think TEDx engineering is a great idea as a result of that. So today, we heard about gloom and doom. We're going to hear some more before we get to the good part, I guess. And we now farm the size of South America as a species. That's an incredible amount of land. South America is really a big place. But 7 billion people need to eat. And so this is what you have to do in order to feed them. That does not include grazing land. And there are some Wisconsin GIS people that think that the entire planet is actually used for food production in areas that can be used. World population is growing, of course, we all know this. It's growing faster in developing than non-developing regions, or <laughs> deteriorating regions, as I like to say, overdeveloped. And in, a, in the next, perhaps, I used to say 50 years, but it's now 2011, almost 2012, uh, in another 40 years or less, we might have another 3 billion people to feed. Now, if this is how much land 7 billion people need, it's estimated this is how much more land another 3 billion people need in order to f eat the same way we're eating now. And a, a lot of us wouldn't agree that we're eating well, but at least we're all alive still. So if this is how much total land there is, 
we've already used up 80% of it. So there isn't the size of Brazil left to farm with. So even if we're okay, the next three billion are not. So granted, agriculture being our best friend, just 10,000 years old in terms of technology, that's not a long time. Imagine living 12,000 years ago. What's for dinner? I don't know. Have you gone out and hunted today? <laughs> and that's what's for dinner. Or have you gathered today? Because if you haven't, then there's nothing to eat. <laughs> so we said, oh, well, gee, this is a drag. You know, you have to go out every day and do this? Well, sometimes not. If you hit a big mammoth and you stash him away in some cave, you might be able to feed on that for a while. But this, still, it's a problem. So 10,000 years ago, a, a space alien came down and taught us all how to farm. It just seems that way. In about 10 different places throughout the world, within a 2,000-year period, we were growing corn, rice, barley, wheat, millet, and tapioca. <laughs> Bizarre. Today, if you fast forward that technology today, it's basically the same. Now we use 20% of our fossil fuel in the United States just to farm. We use herbicides and fertilizers and pesticides to augment the non-ecological situation that we've created by a farm. Certainly we don't favor biodiversity, so we have to get rid of all the non-farm products this way. And we use 70% of the world's available fresh water to irrigate. And granted, we've grown from about a million people 10,000 years ago to 7 billion people now. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, that's a good thing. Imagine us as one big giant supercomputer. Your brain is the computer. So now we've got 7 billion computers all working together using the internet to solve the next big problem, which is how do we accommodate another 3 billion people? So the biggest problem with raising food, as I can see it, is this thing right over here. Besides disrupting all of the ecosystems of the world, you have agricultural runoff to deal with. And agricultural runoff spoils the estuaries. And the estuaries are where your seafood comes from. So all of that nitrogen and phosphorus that you can recover from human feces, that stays out of the estuary and prevents agricultural runoff if we could do it. Actually, not, not I'm sorry, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Because if we take human feces and get the, pho the phosphate out of it, we still haven't prevented the runoff that occurs on the farm, but at least we'll have prevented the runoff after we eat what's on the farm. But look at the devastation it's caused throughout the world, and it's certainly in the United States alone, we've had major floods in these years, and this year turns out to be the worst flood year in the Earth's history, unless you're a biblical person, and then of course we did have one other that was a little bit worse than that one. <laughs> but right now we've got facing us the cleanup from the worst flood that Southeast Asia has ever had, that Australia has ever had, that the United States has ever had, uh, that in, in even Europe had a, a terrible spring flood that destroyed lots of crops and the possibility of growing food. What has all this done to the price of food? Well, if you spent 50% of your income on food 10 years ago, you're now spending 100% of your income on food. That can't work, okay? So these are people that are now living not just below the poverty limit, not just below the pyramid, but they're living, they're, they're probably not living. That's probably what that means. Yes, we are an urban creature. We live like termites or ants. We are social. We need to be in touch with each other. Why else for the internet? Why else for cell phones? Why else for TV? <clears throat> because we want this. We want to know where everybody is. And if that's the case, then we've, we've accumulated all of us in just 2 to 3% of the Earth's landmass but we've emitted about 70% of all the carbon from just those single few places that you can see. So we've concentrated the resources and then we've created these huge pollution problems. Cities are black boxes. You guys love black boxes. This is the way to look at it. A city, things go in, we don't know what happens, and then things go out. The things that come in are resources. The things that go out are waste products, and you are the result of all of that. Okay, so if that's the case, and you think, well, yeah, that's the way a modern city probably behaves, we're getting a little better handle on what goes out, 
all of these things here, but still it's kind of a black box. You wonder about those other cities. These are the cities that no longer exist that didn't quite pay attention to those things. So they're gone. So if that's the case, here's my big question to you. Can we do this? Can we provide a, a sustainable, safe, and abundant food and water supply for 10 billion people? The answer is yes, if Brazil is willing to allow us to use Brazil for that purpose. But that's not going to happen. You know it isn't going to happen because there are Brazilians that live there too. So we have to do this other thing as well. You have to repair the environment. If you don't repair the environment, then you can calculate just how long you have to live as a species. All right? And it's not that much longer. So if we are to live sustainably, and that's what this whole session is about, and I guess that's why you put me last, <laughs> then I know we can do this. How do I know that? Because we've captured the dust from the tail of a comet and brought it back to Earth and looked at it. We know what's in the tail of that comet. How? Well, we used aerogel. You did all of this. The NASA engineers did that. That's an enormously complicated problem compared to just feeding and getting clean water to 7 billion people. But everybody has to want to do this for it to happen. So how can you get everybody to want to do it? Well, I think you create economic incentives and you <laughs> give people jobs to do and you make life better in the process. That's how you make it so unacceptable not to do it that to not to do it is essentially uh, giving up your um, humanity. So my suggestion is that we start with growing our food somewhere else. And the modern greenhouse is a good place to start because the modern greenhouse, as opposed to the old greenhouses, doesn't have any windows that open. The old greenhouses had windows. And the old greenhouses were single-storied. And these greenhouses are multiple-storied. And they don't use soil. So we don't have the worry about agricultural runoff because there isn't any. And we don't have the issue of all that fertilizer going to waste because it's all targeted to the root systems of the plants. It's all done hydroponically and aeroponically. And if you do those things, as shown here, then there are endless possibilities, and I'm not kidding, endless possibilities. To prove it, go to the Bronx Botanical Garden or the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens and look inside those buildings and see what they're growing. They're growing all the exotic plants of the world indoors. How do they do that? How do they do that? Well, they do it by matching the conditions that the plants need. So if you look at this list, partial list, no question about it, you can find your favorite food or um, things on this list. You can find grains. You can find leafy green vegetables, of course. You can find fruits. And we're going to have to go a little faster. <laughs> So you do this and you get vertical farming. So the advantages of a vertical farm are no runoff, year-end production of crops, no crops lost from severe weather events, uses 70% less water, and allows restoration of damaged ecosystems, very important. But it also remediates gray water. It creates new jobs, you, not, you need to hear that. Supplies fresh produce to inner city dwellers, uses abandoned city properties. And you can grow other things there too. We create the eco city. The ecocity starts with mimicking nature. The best plan in nature is the ecosystem. Ecosystems are balanced, diverse, and resilient. That adds up to sustainability. And here's the way it might look. This is a little bit Jetson-like, but I can see the parks. I can see the places for the kids. I can see the places to go to relax. So we know how to do some of these things already. We have toolboxes. We can use those toolboxes to put together a vertical farm inside of a city, a multiple story greenhouse that raises our food and takes care of, of the waste and the water. And here's Santa Ana, California taking care of black water, converting it to drinking water. You think they'd drink that? Of course not. They had to get them to pour it over the ground and pump it out of the ground in order to prove to them that it's not coming from that building where all their feces went. But they still drank the water. In Japan, plasma art gasification as a way of handling waste is gaining popularity. And today, 
we have six vertical farms that weren't in existence three years ago. Three years ago, this was just a wild, crazy idea whose time might have come. And today, I can show you this vertical farm. I can show you these places. Here's one. This farm was built in two years. I, and here I am. <laughs> and here I am again. And this shows you why this can happen here. This is the energetics of light efficient LED grow lights that match the wavelengths of chlorophyll A and B. There's an engineering science to all of this. Here's the one in Japan. They've just built their second one. Here's the one they're building underground in Holland. And here's one that's going up in Seattle, making use of an abandoned automobile manufacturing plant. Here's one that took advantage of an abandoned meatpacking plant in Chicago. So you're right, it's time for me to stop talking. <laughs> and it's time for all of us to start doing. That's the IBM mantra, and I believe in it because it works. I want to save water. I want to farm smart. I want to keep our blue planet green. If you want to learn more, of course I have a book. <laughs> when this book first came out, it was hardcover. That was in 2010, there were no vertical farms. None were up yet. When the soft cover book came out, there were three. That was three months ago. There are now three more. That's six. Can you do the math? Plot that one out on a graph, and you know where that's going. Wouldn't you like to work in one? Of course you would. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>